Hey guys, I missed y'all on Tuesday. Um, so I'm going to try to finish the respiratory handout. And since I don't have access to a classroom, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to screen sharing mode in just a little bit. And um, I'm going to kind of type in the notes as we go along. And afterwards, I will post the completed notes. So if the diagrams don't come out, um, particularly well, at least you'll uh, have that option. So let me switch over to sharing my screen and we will go ahead and get started. Okay, so we're talking about airflow, pressure gradients, and resistance. So here's what we're going to do first. Remember that air flows from high pressure to low pressure. So here, you know, we can kind of go over here. Air flows from high pressure to low pressure. Now, delta P stands for the pressure gradient. So the change in pressure, the greater the pressure gradient, let's switch over, let's get everything bold here, the greater the airflow that is going to go into the alveoli because right now we're talking about breathing in so we want to breathe into the lungs. Now we can change uh, the pressure gradient by altering the volume of our thoracic cavity. We already talked about that, how that's where the diaphragm and those external intercostal muscles will contract and then they'll recoil. Now resistance is on the bottom here of our equation. So the greater the resistance here, we're going to be talking about the less the airflow. So it, it's resisting air going into it. That's primarily due to the bronchioles. This is the part of the airway that has lots of smooth muscle. They're sort of like the arterioles. So this is where um, once the main stem, primary and secondary bronchi start to break apart, you get into these smaller vessels uh, called bronchioles and they have a lot of smooth muscle. They can um, constrict or they can relax. So under parasympathetic stimulation, remember that is rest and digest, rest and digest. So you're going to get a decrease in the diameter of the bronchioles. So that means you're going to get an increase in the resistance, which means you're going to have a decrease in airflow because resistance, again, is in the bottom of this equation. So if resistance goes up, airflow goes down. Now, when we're on the sympathetic side, remember that is um, fight or flight. So when that happens, you're going to get an increase in the diameter of the bronchioles, so you'll get a decrease in resistance and an increase in airflow. Now, most everybody knows or has seen someone with asthma. So asthma is a condition where there's severe constriction in the smooth muscles in the bronchioles primarily, plus airways actually get plugged with mucus. And so what ends up happening is you can have some physical and chemical factors that can also determine resistance. But when we have asthma, we have a lot of constriction. So what do we give people with asthma? We give them bronchodilators. Guess what those do? So like albuterol, you put somebody on albuterol and it's going to cause an increase in the diameter so decrease in the resistance so the patient can breathe again. That's how it works. So when somebody has a lot of constriction, we want to give them bronchodilators. But because albuterol also activates other parts of the sympathetic nervous system, that's why some people will feel that racing heartbeat. But now other physical and chemical factors that can alter resistance, um, smelling salts, for example, like if you get a whiff of ammonia, that's going to cause um, a decrease in breathing. That's just an example. Let's move down. Let's talk about alveolar surface tension forces. So 
Within the alveoli, that's a little air pocket on the handout that I'm going to post. I've got a little diagram, but as with most um, epithelial tissue, it's uh, lined with water. So, or, you know, it's, it's lined with a liquid. So you have a property called surface tension. So surface tension is going to be the attractive force between these water molecules. And that is due to a concept called hydrogen bonding. I believe you talked about this in AMP1. But water molecules want to stick to each other and they kind of form a little film. Um, it's not visible, but it's, it's a little bit of a film. So what ends up happening is within the alveoli, you have, you produce something called surfactant which it's a lipoprotein and it's a detergent just like dish soap, just like Dawn. So remember how Dawn can be used to clean little ducks after the um, oil spills and stuff? Same principle applies. So it's going to actually help dissolve some of that surface tension and it is produced by alveolar type two. That's a Roman numeral. So type two cells. Very few cells are actually type two. The majority are type one. That's what's used for gas exchange. Only about 5% um, of your alveolar cells are gonna be type two. But so what it does is it is going to interfere with hydro hydrogen, hydrogen bonding. And that happens so the alveoli don't collapse because water is going to want to stick to itself. So that means water on one side of the air pocket is going to want to stick to the water on the other side. And if they stick together, there's no room for air to get in for ha to have gas exchange. Now there is a condition called ARDS, uh, Acute Respiratory Dis Distress Syndrome. Um, there was a big deal um, in Asia outbreak um, of an illness that caused ARDS a few years ago. Maybe you remember it, maybe you don't. But um, let's talk about this acute respiratory dis distress syndrome. We're gonna talk about it um, in infants. So type two alveolar cells, they become active or they mature around two months before birth. Now, so are we able to have babies that are born and viable two months or two months premature? Yes, yes we are. So they can, they're born and if they're more than two months premature, they do not have surfactant. Without surfactant, because they can't, they, these type two cells can't make it, the alveoli, they collapse because that's what it's supposed to prevent collapsing. Therefore, the baby, which is already premature, so it's very small and very young, the alveoli, um, the baby must reinflate the alveoli with each breath. So they have to breathe in really hard in order to get any gas exchange. So with each breath in order to inhale. The purpose of this, the bottom line is it is exhausting and the child is unlikely to be able to continue that on a regular basis. They're not gonna be able to nurse um, or anything else. So what do we do? We have options. What we can do is we treat them with surfactant. We have with synthetic uh, sources now. The only drawback is it's very expensive, but we can do it. Um, or if we know the baby is going to be premature and we have a little bit of a window, so not an emergent situation, what we can do is we can pre-treat mom with some steroids. And that's going to speed up lung development prior to a known premature birth. All right, now how does that work? 
Uh, generally, they're more worried about baby boys. For some reason, baby boys tend to develop their lungs uh, a little bit uh, later than girls. But anyway, if, if they're not sure, what they'll do is they'll, they'll give uh, mom two injections and it's 24 hours apart. And then they'll go ahead and deliver the baby. Uh, they'll try to hold off as long as possible. But, um, and those are called, um, what you give mom, those are called antenatal glucocorticoids. And what those do, the, the, the one that you'll see is, and what you'll see in the chart is called Celestone. That's what we treat mom with. And it is very effective and it has allowed many, many, many babies to survive. If you can't do this and you, uh, you can give them surfactant, it's a lot more expensive and it's a lot harder to get your hands on. So uh, the hospital you're working at may or may not actually have it. If they have a NICU, you'll have it on hand. Now, let's talk about lung compliance. Lung compliance is the ease with which the lungs are and the chest wall are going to expand. So here we're talking about expansion. So how stretchy, how much can you, can you pull them apart? So remember the chest wall expands anytime we inhale. So inhalation, we need lungs to be compliant in order to inhale. People with a condition called pulmonary fibrosis, normally, so me and you, it costs us about 5% of our calories and our basal metabolic energy in order to inhale. In these people, it can be anywhere from 20 to 50% of their energy just to breathe. So they get very exhausted, difficulty, and um, there is a type of pulmonary fibrosis that can affect uh, people as young as 20. So it's not necessarily just, you know, an older population. It can happen very young. On the other hand, we have lung elasticity. Lung el um, elasticity is the recoil. That recoil effect is important for when we breathe out, exhalation. So people with emphysema, which is usually combined with COPD, it's irreversible and there's a loss of gas exchange because there is a widespread destruction of the pulmonary elastic tissue and there's a breakdown in the alveoli. So the ones that the alveoli that are left that aren't destroyed, they get bigger trying to compensate, but they're not gonna be functional. The primary cause is Smoking. Smoking is the primary cause. And in these people, they actually, unlike you and me, they have to expend energy to exhale even on a normal breath. So they're going to get, so not only are they going to be having difficulty, they're going to develop um, what looks like a barrel chest because they can inhale okay, but it's very hard to exhale. So air um, stays trapped in the lungs. So that means they're not getting gas exchange. And what ends up happening, so air is trapped in the lungs. Their lungs are more inflated uh, all the time. And you also get an increase in the size of the accessory breathing muscles. They bulk up a little bit. So uh, they're going to have round chests. Uh, they're also known as pink puffers, again, because they can inhale okay. So they can get oxygen in. Inhale. Ignore my typos. Um, so they have, they have oxygen, and so they're pink. That's good, as opposed to blue when they don't have oxygen. Uh, so, but it's lots of work to exhale. So um, they exhale audibly, so you can hear them exhale, and that is the puffer part. So they're pink because they can get oxygen in, but they have to work really hard to get it out. Now let's talk about volume and capacity. Respiratory volumes and respiratory capacities. How do we measure them? We measure them with a device called a 
spirometer. And you measure somebody's breathing. Now, there are several different types. Refer to this in your book. And I think I've got it pulled up right here. Yes. So here it is in the book. And it's the same diagram. Here is the definition of what they are. I don't have time to go over all of them. Uh, I don't have, I don't do that um, in normal class. Make sure you know all of them. You don't necessarily have to know all these like normal values. Um, I'll talk about the ones you have to know, but do know what, what these are. And these are the basic ones, tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume. And then you have these capacities. The capacities are just different types of things that you add. All right, so let's go back to our notes, which are here. Now, know the definitions of all of them. Now, there's a, a concept called dead space. Dead space is anatomical dead space. That would be what's in your um, normal breathing tubes. Um, and then there's alveolar dead space. So that's your total dead space. Uh, also known as really total lung capacity. But all right. So these are the normal values. Normal tidal volume, 500 milliliters. This is uh, what you're generally exchanging during your resting or your quiet breathing, 500 mils. Vital capacity, that would be this whole bit. So the most you can inhale and the most you can exhale, the most air you could totally possibly move in most people, almost five liters. So in a normal breath, you're only using about 10% of your lung capacity. All right, so let's talk about Alveolar and system, let's talk about gas exchange, how it happens. The body is consuming 200 milliliters of oxygen and producing 200 mils of carbon dioxide per minute through normal aerobic cellular respiration. Now, in the lungs, Oxygen is going to enter the blood at the same rate that it leaves the blood at the body cells. That's just kind of how it works. At the body cells, CO2 is going to enter the capillaries at the same rate that oxygen is entering the body cells. So there's no real um, variation in how the gas is exchanged. It should be exchanged evenly. Now, how it exchanges in the lungs and how it exchanges um, at the capillary and into the body cells depends on the diffusion process. So at any point you have the same oxygen and CO2 levels that you use, same oxygen you use is going to be the same amount of CO2 that you release. All right, now we got to talk about some basic properties of gases. So here's some more gas laws. And there's a good example on page 935 if um, you wanna look at these. Now, gases, they're some individual molecules. They move real high and they're gonna bump against the container. And when they bump against the container, that's pressure. Two ways you can increase pressure. You can increase the temperature and when you do that, you are increasing uh, the speed of the molecules. Whoa, lots of speed. Speed of the molecules. So they're gonna be hitting the walls of the container more frequently, so you're gonna increase the pressure. Or you can also increase concentration of the gas, how much gas is in the container. So if you have more molecules, you're gonna get more um, collisions against the side of the container so you get more pressure. So let's talk about Dalton's law of partial pressure. If you take my chemistry class we talk about this. Now what that means is the pressure exerted by each gas in a mixture is independent. It doesn't matter how much of the other gases you have. 
So you have a concept called partial pressure, because we said Dalton's law of partial pressures, is the pressure that's exerted by each type of gas, each type within a mixture. In a mixture, so it's a measure of the concentration, so of, of each gas. So the more of a gas you have, the higher its partial pressure. And how we write that is, I'm gonna to have to get fancy with some of my subscripts here, is a pressure, well, pressure, and then down in the subscript, you would have O, and then you need a subscript again, but I'm not gonna get into that, but PO2. Or you can do it as pressure of CO2. So that's a subscript. So cap B cap big capital P. All right. Now, if you have a gas mixture, the total pressure, you add up all the partial pressures. All right. So let's talk about this. Let's do a little bit of math. This is just it's not that hard. But if you want to use a calculator, this is just for illustrative purposes. Now, okay, within the atmosphere, nitrogen is 78.6%. Let's pull up a calculator here. Uh, maybe. Type here to search. Calculator. Uh, well, maybe not. Okay. Well, you can do the math. So if you do, there, this equation is also on page 935. Okay. So if you, normal atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. So nitrogen, if you take, convert the percent to a decimal, 0 0.786 times 760, you get 597 millimeters of mercury. Oxygen, uh, 0 0.209 times 760, whoa, times 760, you are going to get something on the lines of 159. CO2, this one's a little bit trickier, so, so you do 0 0.0 Zero, 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 0.004 times 760, you get 0 0.3 millimeters of mercury, and water vapor is 0 0.0046. I need an extra zero. Okay, however it works out. It works out the same. And you get 3.5 millimeters of mercury. Now, if you add all those up, you get, guess what, 760. It works out. That's not on the test, being able to convert that. Now, the partial pressure gradient, that's gonna be the movement of the gas, and it depends on the concentration, which we're gonna measure in concentration in partial pressure of that gas. So each gas moves down its own concentration gradient. So there's um, a drawing that I'm going to do, but say in one side of the mixture you have uh, oxygen and then you have um, carbon dioxide and then you have nitrogen. And now in this, you have five uh, millimeters of mercury. In this side, you have three millimeters of mercury of carbon dioxide. And of nitrogen, you have two millimeters of mercury. So on your on another side here, I'm just gonna copy this. Oh, oh I want it in italics. 
when you're on it on the other side your oxygen is going to be three and your co2 is going to be six and your nitrogen is going to be one now each gas moves down its own pressure gradient so let's determine which way it's going to go so oxygen going down which way is it going to move moving down it's going to go from more concentrated to less concentrated so oxygen is going to go from left to right co2 goes from high to low so it's going to go from right to left and nitrogen is going to go from two to one left to right that's how that that's how that goes and it doesn't matter what any of the others are doing now let's look at our partial pressures in the lungs here okay i'm gonna let me pull up the book again and i gotta scroll down some pages so i'm sorry if i hurt your eyes on this we need to go to the next section okay there there's the partial pressure right there this is the diagram i want to look at and i've got a place for you to draw it in your notes now let's look at this in the alveoli so we're going to look in the lungs right now so here we are we're in the lungs this is in the lungs this is the, this is the air side this is the blood side okay now let's look here in let's look at oxygen first inside the lungs it's 104 in the blood it's 40 oxygen is going to go from high to low so it's going to go from the lungs into the blood now next co2 it's 40 in the lungs it's 45 in the blood moving from high to low it's going to go from the blood to the lungs that's how our bodies work so in the lungs oxygen goes into the blood co2 goes out of the blood and we breathe it out and if you move on down here we are in the capillary and here's the body cells so oxygen first oxygen in the blood is 95 oxygen in the capillaries is 40 oxygen is going to go from 95 to 40 so it's going to go down across from the blood into the tissues co2 again here it's around 45 in the tissues and it's around 40 in the blood so it's going to go out of the cells and into the blood down its own concentration gradient i hope that makes sense now this diagram is showing that as blood flows across it's losing oxygen and gaining co2 which that happens naturally but here's what i care about is blood's going how oxygen is going out of the blood into the tissues co2 is going out of the tissues into the blood and here's our notes there's a place for you to draw it. Impairment of gas exchange in the lungs. Let's pull this out so I've got some room to type. Now, you can have a thickness in the respiratory membrane, so that means it's harder for lung, for um, oxygen and CO2 to get across because they got across a bigger space, so it's less diffusion. So example of that would be a pneumonia, where you got fluid and swell, uh, fluid buildup in the lungs. Um, if you have less surface area so remember somebody in emphysema on the previous page we talked about somebody that has fewer and larger alveoli so they don't have near as much surface area in their air pockets so you want to have a ton of them and you want to be really small so that means their membrane is going to be really thin and so it's really easy for gas to get across all right Next, there's a concept called Henry's Law. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So, how soluble gases are in a liquid. That depends on temperature, 
on the partial pressure of the gas and on something called a solubility constant. We are not going to be calculating any of these. Here's what you need to know. Carbon dioxide is more soluble than oxygen and oxygen is more soluble than nitrogen. We care about nitrogen only because it's the main component of atmospheric air. So we're breathing in whether we want it or not. Oxygen is a very, very, not very soluble at all in water. So what we do is we have hemoglobin. So remember that each hemoglobin can carry how many molecules? It can carry four molecules of oxygen at a time. All right, so we can carry four molecules of oxygen um, at a time. It's carried on the heme. So a fully saturated one has four oxygens. A partially saturated one has one, two, or three oxygens. And deoxyhemoglobin has zero oxygens. Now, Oxygen's bound to iron. You can go back and look at chapter 18 for that. Now, there are conformational changes that occur when oxygen is bound or lost. Don't worry, we don't have too many more pages left. And I'm going to switch back to the textbook um, on a couple of uh, these so you can see some of the um, reactions and how they work. So now the conformational changes, they occur when one oxygen is either bound or lost. So if hemoglobin is deoxy, so it has none, it's really hard to get the first one on. So it wants to stay, it, wa it wants to be the same. It doesn't want to have one, two, or three. It wants to have zero or if it wants to have four. So if you have a fully saturated, hemoglobin, it's hardest to get the first one off, then the rest come off easier. So the rest come off more easily. If you have um, an, um, a deoxyhemoglobin, so a completely unsaturated, it is hardest to get hardest to get the first one on. The rest come on more easily. Now, why is such a small percentage of oxygen dissolved in plasma and most of it is on hemoglobin? Here we go. Oxygen isn't very soluble. That goes back up to this. Oxygen is not very soluble. So hemoglobin gets loaded up with oxygen in the lungs where there's lots of oxygen. So it becomes fully saturated. And then in systemic tissues, any dissolved oxygen moves from the blood into the cells, but most of the oxygen stays bound to hemoglobin. So what we end up having is we have an oxygen reserve. reserve. So as oxygen is moving um, from the blood into the tissues, you get a little bit coming off the hemoglobin to replace it. But most of it, you at any one time, you are carrying way, way, way more oxygen than you need. Okay, now let's talk about, this is where people tend to get really confused. I don't mean to make it confusing, but it's very strange. So carbon dioxide is a little more complicated. Oxygen is a little bit dissolved in the blood, the rest on hemoglobin. That's it. Now, carbon dioxide 
it can be in three three ways so a small fraction about 10% which is way more than oxygen is actually physically dissolved in the plasma so it's much more soluble so about 10% of it is there about 25% reacts directly with hemoglobin and it forms carbamino hemoglobin forms carbamino hemoglobin now remember here remember co2 can only bind with the globin portion of deoxyhemoglobin so if it if the hemoglobin has any oxygen on it at all it's not going to carry carbon dioxide it doesn't carry oxygen and carbon dioxide at the same time so here's our little reaction co2 plus uh, hemoglobin gives us um, um, gives us hemoglobin plus CO2 stuck to it. And now I'll just switch to math. But anyway, that's okay. Uh, now, but most of it, here's the most of it. Most of it switches from, so this is 65%. The vast majority of hemoglobin reacts with water, forms the bicarbonate ion. All right, so here we go. Here's our reaction. You have CO2 plus H2O uh, forms uh, carbonic acid, which is H2CO3. Carbon dioxide is going to dissolve into HCO3, which has a minus one and a hydrogen ion. Now, hi, th this here, this here, this is the bicarbonate ion. The bicarbonate ion is HCO3 minus one. That's the bicarbonate ion. Now, it does this, and the car the bicarbonate ion we care about that because it is very soluble. Now, how this happens, carbon dioxide mixes with water to form carbonic acid, which decomposes into the bicarbonate ion. But the carbon dioxide in the water, with the help of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, that's in the red blood cells. Okay, so here we go. Here's where things are going to get a little bit weird. Now, this reaction here occurs primarily in the red blood cells because that's where they hold this enzyme. Now, we're gonna talk about this stuff in a little bit, but let me pull up our next section, which is here gas transport okay gas transport here we go so co2 goes into the red blood cells here's carbonic anhydrase you get carbonic acid it splits into the bicarbonate ion which is super duper soluble so it can go back out in the plasma and hydrogen hydrogen has a reaction on hemoglobin Acid causes hemoglobin to release some oxygen. Now, in the pulmonary capillaries, again, we'll talk about this in a little bit, there's an exchange of chloride to buffer that. So, um, your bicarbonate ion is going to go into here so in your notes where it says blood is going to it's going to go to the right so this is what's happening 
our reactions going to the right. CO2 is making H2O, making carbonic acid, which diffuses because we're, we're adding more carbon dioxide and we're losing oxygen. Now, in the capillaries, we're going to go the other way. See how this arrow is going to the left? So we're bringing bicarbonate in, we're combining it with hydrogen, forming carbonic acid, breaking down into CO2, which we breathe out. I'll say this several times, but that's where we are for right now. And so it's going to be moved down to concentration gradient. We blow it out. Now, let's look at hemoglobin. The pressure of oxygen, so it's, it's, this is how it's, it's dissociated. So the pressure of oxygen, wherever. Now generally, let me turn my page here. Oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin does not contribute to this at all. This is only dissolved hemoglobin. So oxygen in the tissues only matters with how much is dissolved. So what's our advantage of having hemoglobin? You can carry huge amounts of oxygen as a reserve for when you need it. So you can carry a very large amount of oxygen. Now, normally, you're going to get somewhere around, you're going to be somewhere around here, around point D, when you breathe in. This is, you're still going to be, under normal conditions, you're still going to have 75% of your hemoglobin loaded with oxygen by the time you make it out of, uh, make it all the way through your systemic circulation. So you've got a lot of reserve so for when you start exercising or anything like that, something happens and all of a sudden you need more oxygen, you've got it. So when oxygen starts dropping, then you can use it. Now, let's talk about these influences here. This tends to confuse people. It's not meant to be confusing, but you have to remember this carbonic and hydrase reaction. So rewrite the reaction somewhere over here that way it'll help you so why would your temperature ever increase if you have a fever that's the primarily one or it can also increase when you exercise because you start sweating so when your temperature increases at the same pressure of oxygen 40 in the tissues, you need, you've unloaded 20% more oxygen. So, hey, that's not a bad thing. So, why do we want to unload ox more oxygen when our body temperature is higher? Because our cells need the oxygen uh, for uh, the increase in our um, basal metabolic rate and our increased uh, ATP needs. So we need more oxygen so we can make ATP. Now this was mentioned up at the, the bottom of the last page, acidity, so the pH, that means when we have free hydrogen ions. This is called the Bohr effect, after Niels Bohr if you take my chemistry class. Now, normal pH, remember, 7.4. So here we are right here, 7.4. Our hydrogen is higher in the tissue capillaries than in the arteries because of this reaction right here. We, you know, we're moving carbon dioxide out of the tissues into the blood. So here we're going to have hydrogen some hydrogen, so, we're, so our, our pH is going to be changing in uh, the capillaries. Now, when you have an increase in your carbon dioxide, you're naturally going to have an increase in your hydrogen ions. So that means you're going to be acidic. More hydrogen means acidic. And that means you're going to have a lower pH. So here, 
it's not going to be this dramatic. But for example, if the pH gets way down to 7.2, it doesn't, but just in case. So here we are, here, if we draw the same imaginary line at 40, we've gone from 80% down to about 70%. So it's going to start releasing oxygen. Release, so it's releasing more oxygen. High pH, or sorry, high hydrogen ions, lower pH triggers more oxygen release. Now, hydrogen is lower in the lung capillaries than in the venous blood, so we get an increase in pH, so we're going to pretend the 7.6. So that means at the same 40%, whoa, you're all the way up to like 95% here, 95% hemoglobin. So this is good, so the increase in the pH helps hemoglobin uh, load up on oxygen and hold on tight. Hopefully that helps. Now there is a con there is a property. It's called BPG. It stands for two three biphosphoglycerate. You don't have to remember that. We call it BPG. It's formed by red blood cells because they use only use anaerobic. Now it binds reversibly with hemoglobin, and it causes hemoglobin to change shape and please <laughs> release oxygen. Why is this beneficial? Why do we care? So BPG says release oxygen. So that means when red blood cells are um, very busy, so they're working hard, that means you, your body, is also busy and you need more oxygen. So when you are forming this BPG, it says release the oxygen so you can use it. The last thing, there's not a graph that goes along with this, is the partial pressure of CO2. So when you have an increase in CO2, that would increase um, during exercise because you're busy. Um, it also tends to increase uh, when you're ill Why is it beneficial for hemoglobin to release oxygen when you have a higher partial pressure of CO2? Because your body cells need more oxygen. That's the bottom line. All these situations generate are generated because the body needs more oxygen. So if you need more oxygen, here's what can happen. And you can raise the temperature and you're going to get a release of oxygen from hemoglobin. You can lower the pH, make more hydrogen, more acidic, and you're going to get release of oxygen. You can produce more BPG in the red blood cells. That's going to release oxygen. Or you can cause an increase in your carbon dioxide partial pressure, and you're going to get a release of oxygen. So hopefully that helps. Now, let's talk about some impairments. Because if something works, there's always a way for it not to work. Look, it's the last page. Okay, hypoxia is a condition where there's low oxygen delivery to tissues. When you don't have very much oxygen and you start to turn blue, use called cyanotic. cyanotic cyan meaning blue think about your colors okay now there's also a condition called anemic hypoxia that happens because you don't have enough red blood cells or you don't have enough hemoglobin now this seems redundant no not yet stagnant hypoxia. That happens when the blood circulation gets blocked, so blood's not moving, so you're not getting gas exchange. You can't get new, new fresh oxygen to the tissues, so when there's a blood clot or another blockage where it's not supposed to be, um, or congestive heart failure, you're not circulating blood. Now here's something that is important. 
when you have something that interferes with gas exchange, you get it something that's called hypoxemic hypoxia, and that sounds redundant, but this is where you're not getting enough oxygen exchange. Example, CO carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide poisoning. So carbon monoxide poisoning. So we'll say carbon monoxide, where you know what CO is. So the hemoglobin has an affinity or um, a preference for carbon monoxide that is 200 times greater than how much it loves or prefers oxygen. So what ends up happening is hemoglobin gets stuck with carbon monoxide and the carbon monoxide is stuck. So the hemoglobin can't load any oxygen because it's already stuck, it's already got carbon monoxide on it and it's not coming off because for every one oxygen that it's willing to put on, it puts on 200 carbon monoxide. So that occupies all the hemoglobin. Now, here you go. Hemoglobin that's bound with carbon monoxide um, turns the skin bright pink. So that's something you can look for. Um, the uh, paramedics will look for carbon monoxide poisoning. They don't turn blue. They turn bright pink because hemoglobin uh, has that structural change when it's bound turns red so they don't turn blue they, they look really bright pink now let's talk about our see if I can find a page here not really a good page I don't think no all right I'll do the best I can here. You, you may have to get the, uh, see the completed handout for these diagrams. But so let's talk about how hydrogen gets transferred. So remember our chemical reaction. Um, CO2 plus H2O, I'll draw the arrows in a second, makes carbonic acid, which decomposes into HCO3, Minus, you have to know this equation, write it down, it's on the test, plus positive hydrogen. I'm going to copy and paste this in a second. So let me put in some arrows. Learn this, this little trick um, for chemistry. Okay, now, so there's our equation. You have to know it. Most of the oxygens don't remain free in the blood. So they're bound to plasma proteins because you've got these buffering systems. So now you don't get much of a, you don't see much of a physiological decrease in pH as a result of this reaction because it's going to get stuck on other things. So it doesn't decrease the pH. Now deoxyhemoglobin, that's hemoglobin with no oxygen on it, can actually pick up some hydrogen. So it's going to get, you're going to have some hemoglobin. So you can have hemoglobin with a little bit of hydrogen stuck on it. So some of it gets transported that way. So very few free hydrogen ions stay free. So venous pH is only slightly lower. So we can say that venous blood is slightly more acidic than um, arterial blood. However, now as blood reaches the lungs, let me get my little equation here. Here's our equation. Here's our equation. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to go, we're going to move our reaction to the left. So we have our hydrogen, free hydrogen ions here. And in the lungs, they are going to um, 
form carbonic acid, which is going to form water and carbon dioxide. And then guess what you do? You are going to exhale carbon dioxide out of the body from your lungs. Doesn't that make sense? Yay, the body makes sense. Now, here we go. Let's talk about breathing rate and homeostasis. Because see, here's what's happening in, this, in um, the tissues. You're making hydrogen in the blood. You're converting it back to CO. You're using it to convert back to CO2. Now, what is pH? Remember, it is the negative log, the concentration of hydrogen ions. We're not going to calculate it. What you need to know is it's a, it's a measure. It's a measure of free hydrogen ion. Free, that means it's, n it's not bound to any plasma protein and it's not bound to hemoglobin. Now, this is an application process, so you need to be able to do this. So when you have hypoventilation, you're breathing really slow, you're breathing shallowly. You're going to have um, CO2 buildup, so you're going to get an increase in CO2. So that's going to move. This reaction is going, you're, you're building up CO2. So here you are, you're building up CO2. And so you're going to move it this way. So you're going to say reaction moves to the right. So you're going to get, as a result, more hydrogen ion. So you're going to have a lower pH. So you would be more acidic. So this is controlled by your breathing, so it's called respiratory, and we're decreasing pH, so this would be respiratory acidosis. You can also have metabolic. We're not talking about that at all. So, but because we're it's dealing with breathing, it's called respiratory. We're breathing shallowly. We're making, we're building up CO2. So. We're making more hydrogen, so it's acidosis. Now, when you're breathing really deep and you're blowing off a lot of CO2, you are going to have a decrease in CO2, which is going to cause your reaction to move to the left, just like it does in the lungs. So here we go. This is what happens. You're blowing off a lot of CO2, so you're continuing. So what ends up happening is you have less hydrogen ion floating around. Less hydrogen ions means you have a higher pH, which means you're less acidic, or you can say you're more alkaline. So let's say, which one is this? Well, it's respiratory, because it has to do with our breathing, and we've become less acidic, so that would be alkalosis. Hopefully that makes sense. Hey, I'm back. All right, so hopefully that makes sense to some degree. Again, I'm going to post the completed notes. Please watch the video, though. Uh, hopefully it makes, uh, it makes a little more sense. Um, bring any questions that you have to lecture. I'm also going to send out the quiz that goes along uh, with this section of the notes and just bring it back next week. And I haven't forgotten about um, how to get back some test points. So we'll still talk about that. And um, I think that's everything that I'm going to be talking about for this lecture. Um, so be ready to start the Chapter 24 lecture. Again, I'll be able to answer any questions you have on this. Um, chapter 23, either from last week or from this uh, video section. And hopefully that'll help you. We'll see how it goes. I will see you on Tuesday. Again, don't forget to just email me, use the discussion board, any of that. But we should be able to pick up right uh, on target next week.